Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Beautiful sunshiny morning. It's good to have everybody here this morning. I was just telling them we're gonna get a few more people on this side. We're gonna have to share some balance. It's gonna start sinking over on that on this side over here. But we're glad to see everybody that came on both sides of the church, both sides of the aisle, whatever you're on. It's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, Amen. You got a song? Yes, sir. We do. Let's do 300 this morning. 300. In the red book. <laughs> that's right. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Randall was talking about that good old sunshine. That's another one of them blessings we got this morning. So I thought that'd be nice because it said uh, in Psalms, you know, many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works. They are... Uh, more than can be numbered. And I'm telling you, when we start thinking about it, we do have more blessings than we can count. Amen. We really do. If you ever uh, try to try to start writing them down, you'll be there a good while. Say so we have more than we deserve. We do. Yes, we do, by far. 300. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. every doubt will fly and you will be singing as the days go by count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see what God has That Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven nor your home on high. <coughs> Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. for us sometimes though because of, of our disobedience because of the things that we do we don't get the blessings that God would like to give us <clears throat> we would, uh, you know, if we were better people we'd get more blessings wouldn't we you know uh, <clears throat> pardon me uh, the Bible says that the uh, fervent uh, uh, effectual 
I mean, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I'll get out there in a minute. So he does expect a certain amount of righteousness out of Not his righteousness. We can't attain to his righteousness. We understand that. Uh, but we do need, we, we do, uh, are required to, to keep a certain amount of righteousness. <clears throat> We're going to go out and take some uh, prayer requests. But uh, uh, Dexter's son, uh, Alan's mother-in-law, is, uh, I think at the hospital getting checked out, I think she may have had a uh, heart attack, maybe. My sister Sarah said that uh, she's not feeling well today. Keep her in your prayers. Pam and her mother. Pam and her mother are both asking prayer. Yeah. Savannah wants you to pray for her niece. She was having a seizure. some seizures and not in... Who is? Oh, her niece, Savannah's niece. What's her name? Okay. Aubrey? Aubrey, yes. How old is she? Aubrey is having a uh, Eight seat. years old. Eight years old. Uh, wow. And uh, speaking of that, uh, our niece, my Dexter, and uh, some other niece, uh, and relative Alex, is uh, was supposed to have brain surgery, but the insurance won't pay for it, so she is postponed at least until they get something worked out. And uh, it's because of seizures is why she's having it. Maybe to April. Maybe till April. Okay. So keep them all in your prayers. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Me and my family and Jason and Maria and. The whole situation there for sure. That's yeah. a bad, bad situation. They all still sick, or are they getting better? Well, they said that Dylan uh, has a clear cell sarcoma, and it's kind of rare. There's only like two hundred thousand cases in the United States. Wow, well, he's got all kinds of trouble, isn't he? Yeah, they just had COVID too. They just got yeah. over COVID. Yeah. yeah. Just talk to Maria. Right. Keep them all in your prayers for sure, Kim. Uh, there's a, a guy that Dwayne works with that lost his daughter last week. They actually oh, buried her yesterday. She was only third. She's actually age thirty something. Wow. Had a blood clot very sudden. No, you know. That's sad. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah, pray for that family for sure. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Remember, Larry. His foot's better. The cat. Uh, Tiffany's got the COVID, so he claims it didn't want to come. Okay. Remember Larry and his family? He always asks prayer for his family, too. Brenda? Uh, my mom, she's having some health issues. Okay. How old is your mother? 88. 88. 88. I see Miss Geneva is not here today. Pray for her and her family as well. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Anybody? Yes, sir. My prayer list Nancy Collins, Lucy Mays, Victor Clay Hurl. Okay. And let's pray for CA as well as we always ask, of course, Stu, in his prayer list. Anybody else, y'all, buddy? Yeah, he's got a procedure on uh, one of his eyes. Uh, Gene March, does? Yeah, on March the 13th, so pray for him. That's pretty close to his birthday, isn't it? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. I know his birthday because it was near mine. Mine and William were pretty close to it. Anybody else? <clears throat> Anybody else? Anybody got a silent request on your heart? God, God does know your heart. He knows what we stand in need of. But he still does ask us to ask, and we're, and we're supposed to ask. He does tell us to ask. He don't ask us to ask. He tells us to ask. He don't have to ask, does he? No. Because he makes commandments. Right. You know, people don't take commandments from us probably too good, but, uh, you know, we ought to, do, we ought to uh, do the commandments that God sets before us. We ought to try to do them. If any man will, come on up and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Why would you lead us in prayer this morning, brother? Heavenly Father, thank you for one more the opportunity to come into your house to worship you, Lord. We thank you for this church and all the members of it. Lord, we just ask that you would bless all the prayer requests that we mentioned here this morning. You want to stand in need of it. Lord, we just ask that you'd bless Brother Randall when he comes to the stand and give him a good message to be supplied yeah. here, Father. And Lord, we just ask this all in the name of your Son, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And amen. 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 Uh, if you're able to stand up, if you're not, you can remain seated. But uh, we're going to go ahead and take up the uh, 
uh, the offering for the church, the running of the church, the building fund, the ladies club if you want to give it for it. And, uh, and you can send it in on the video if you can send it in if you'd like to uh, P.O. Box 151 Alexandria, Kentucky 41001. We are, of course, New Macedonia Baptist Church with Pastor Randall Baker. We're at 12th and Central in Newport. Uh, if you're able to, come down and join us sometime. We'll be glad to have you. Yes, sir. Uh, so we're going to, you got a song for us? Yes, sir, I do. 135. This is a good old one that uh, they used to sing around here a lot. Old Brother C.A. used to do this. 135, he said. Everybody sing with it. Yes, Never sir. Call. So just uh, help us out this morning. It's a good old song. Yes, it is. This is a good one. I'll not be a stranger when I get to that city. I'm acquainted with folks over there. They'll be friends there to greet me. They'll be loved ones to meet me at the gates of that city four square. Through the years, through the tears, Christ the mighty 
the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the Alright, you got a song you want to sing? Yeah, come on up and sing one. I see. 
the light, build a land I'm longing for you, and someday on the I'll stand there my There's a story so unkind in the holy book we find, and it tells how Jesus stood alone one day, false accused and then condemned, but they found no fault with him. The man who wore the scarlet purple Purple robe my Savior wore, oh what shame for me he bore, as he stood alone, forsaken on that day, and they placed upon his head, piercing thorns of blood stained red, and his raiment was a scarlet purple robe. In the common judgment hall, he was mocked and scorned by all. And tears of sorrow fell upon his cheeks. Soldiers of the wicked band smote him with their evil hands, and his raiment was a scarlet purple robe, purple robe my Savior wore, oh what shame for me he bore, as he stood alone forsaken on that day, and they placed upon Piercing thorns of blood stained red, and his raiment was a scarlet purple robe. Words of truth that day were claimed from the lips of Pilate came. In this man I find no reason he should die, but the multitude then cried, let him now be crucified. The man who wore the scarlet purple robe, purple robe my Savior wore, oh what shame for me he bore, as he stood alone forsaken on that day, and they placed upon his head piercing thorns of blood stained red, and his raiment was the scarlet purple robe. I think according to that song, it's pretty right that Jesus went through a lot for us, for our salvation. A lot of suffering, suffered death, a lot of agony. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And he did it all for us. He gave up great riches in heaven to come down here to die for us. You got a song you want to sing you and Tanya? No, we're, we're good. Oh. Thank you. I was going to uh, think about singing that, uh, I can't think of how to start it. That song I used to sing, uh, uh, the reunion about the reunion uh, in heaven. Uh, what is that? Family reunion. 
No. Uh, what is it? Well, the circle will be unbroken. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, now I can't even think how it started. I think it's in this book. Do you think it's in that book? I don't think it's the same words, though, is it? Oh, I don't know. What's it? Is that, uh, sir, will the circle be unbroken? Yeah, will the circle be unbroken? Yeah. I'll, I'll give it a try. I think I got it. Huh? 59 in this book. You want this book? I'll try. Yeah, I'll give me a try. I've, I've, I've sung it in a while and I, uh, memory ain't like it used to be. <laughs> That's not it at all. Well, you just changed the words. It's, a different, it's keep, different words. That'll get you started, though, all right? Don't get me started wrong, so I won't even use it. <laughs> I was standing by my window on one cold and cloudy day <coughs> when I saw the hearse come rolling for to carry my mother away. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. I forgot, I've forgotten it already. Hold the book back up. Now the book's wrong. It's got, got not have the right words. I'll try to get the words to it. If nobody has another song they want to sing or anything, I will uh, go ahead and start the service. <clears throat> go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. I want to talk about something I have talked about in the past, but I'm going to give you a little different uh, view on it this time. We'll talk about the temple and the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness. Let's go ahead and say a prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all you give us. Lord, all the wonderful and perfect lessons you give us, Lord, and uh, all those good songs, Lord, that have, have uh, such a meaning, Lord, about your, about your crucifixion, about the wonderful things that you've done for us, the wonderful things you can do for us, Lord. Just thank you so much for it. Bless us today, Heavenly Father, and give us the uh, anointment to sing, to, 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 to sing whatever we sing, Lord, and to praise your name, whatever we do, and to preach your word, Lord, uh, just the way that you would have it to do. Lord, prepare the hearts of those to receive a message that may help them in some way. Someone's lost and undone, Lord, that might be able to help them to see that they are lost, Lord, and heading for a devil's hell, Lord, and that you are the only way into heaven. And we'll thank you for it. We ask this all in Jesus Christ's name, and amen. Amen. Uh, as I said, turn to Exodus chapter 25. Hey, I'm going to talk about the, the te temple of God and the tabernacle in the wilderness. Now, both are, are talked about in the Bible. They're both talked about in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are both physical buildings or were physical buildings. Neither one I'm standing now. Uh, but they are both symbolic of things that God wants us to understand. <laughs> When we read the Bible, it's a whole lot like when we ate a meal when we were young, we were little kids. We'd focus on the good parts of it, and then we'd disregard or push away the things that we didn't like. We didn't pay much attention to them. We'd hurry on through uh, the things uh, or certain areas of it that uh, we didn't care that much about, and then we'd savor our favorite ones. Now, now, I mean, who, who of us wants to pour over the book of Numbers? Uh, but, but then when we turn over and say like Revelation or something, we could talk all day or, or read all day about that. But God said this, and, and uh, I told you to turn to 25, so stay there. In, in Exodus 29, 45, God said, And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their gods. Now, why did Israel need a tabernacle? Why did they need a temple? Because, uh, you know, Moses was talking to him and he was telling him the things that God had him to say. And, and, when, and he would sometimes get up on a, on a hill and he would talk to him a hill. He would try to get up on a cliff or an overhang of some type. And he would tell him from there what God had to say for him, what God wanted him to do or what God wanted him to say. Uh, so they didn't really need it. When, you know, when Jacob was out, when he was uh, out there going to Paden, uh, Aram, and he, uh, and he uh, had his dream when he was out in the desert there and he was laying there and he had his stone for a pillow and he had a dream. He dreamed about a ladder and he dreamed about he saw angels ascending and descending on and he saw the most high at the top of that ladder, he said. And when he left here, he said, this is nothing but the house of God. And I knew it not. And he said, he called the name of the place Bethel. And Bethel means house of God. That's what it means. Does God really need a building? Does he really need a building? You know, when it's cold outside, today's a nice, a nice sunny day, but when it's cold, when it's raining, when it's snowing, or there's 
some bad weather, we, we'd get inside to get out of that weather. We, need a, we like a building. We like warmth and we like all that stuff. But God doesn't need protection from nature. You know, he, he invented all that. He created all of it and he, he controls all of it. So what God, what reason then did God have for telling Israel to build a tabernacle, to build a temple? And what difference is there between the tabernacle and the temple? After God had had Moses to lead Israel out, after he'd had them to lead out of Egypt and the bondage in there, and then they wandered through the wilderness, in the wilderness, as the Bible even tells us that it was desert, but as they wandered through there for 40 years, while Moses was up on that Mount Sinai, when he was up there, he received the Ten Commandments, but that's not all he received. He was up there for 40 days and 40 nights, and God gave him a whole lot more things at that time. God, at that time, gave him the plans, the instructions to build a tabernacle. And he told him the furnishings to go in there, and he told him what would be for the, for the priests and how they were to act and what they were to wear. He told him a whole lot of things. Now, the first thing that God told Moses to do when he got back to the Israelites, or the children of Israelites, was to bring some offerings to him. Was they were to bring gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet and fine linen, goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins and sheet of wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So he gave him, he told him to go in and you get all these supplies to build this tabernacle and to, and, to, and to furnish the tabernacle and then things for the priest also. These items would be reused to build that, that tabernacle and that tabernacle was a portable temple. It was a portable temple and it needed to be portable at that time because they had to wander because they were not allowed to go into that area that God had given them into that land of Canaan uh, for 40 years. They had to wander. They were not permitted to enter the promised land. And they were to bring gold. I'm only going to talk about gold a little bit for just a second. But gold uh, is there for, for a very good reason because gold has a, has a value. It's always had a certain value and it always does. It's always a valuable thing because gold is pure. And that's what they were supposed to use was the purest of gold, the purest gold. Gold lasts. It lasts a long time and it can always be refined. It can always be purified again. And gold is symbol, symbolizing stuff. It symbolizes God's majesty. His eternal nature and His purity. A lot of gold is used, especially when they made the temple. They plated everything with gold. They put gold around everything. Speaking of the, uh, the uh, temple, the dictionary defines temple as a house of worship. And it also says it can be a dwelling place or a temporary shelter. Now I'm going to tell you right here, we're going to go right here and look at this, but here's why God says that the temple was needed. In uh, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 25, verse 8, it says this, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Make him a sanctuary. I want you to turn over just maybe a page in your Bible to Exodus 26, 15. Exodus 26, 15. Now the question would be this. The question would come to my mind is this. What is a sanctuary then that God told him to build for him? Now we usually think of a sanctuary, we think of a safe place, some place where you would go to, for protection, or for your his or hers protection. Uh, but, but God, does God need protection from anything? He doesn't, does he? There's nothing that, God, that can harm God or, or, uh, or hurt God in any way. So of course God doesn't need protection or God doesn't need a sanctuary from anything that can harm him. But when we go back to sanctuary and we really look at sanctuary really good, it literally means this, a holy or sacred place comes from the word sacred, uh, the word sacred comes from that, and saint comes from that also. Uh, so in order for God to bring his presence, for him to bring his glory into that temple or into that tabernacle, it had to be holy, it had to be sanctified, it had to be in, in good uh, standings with him. The Bible in Exodus goes into great detail of how to make that, how to make every single part and parcel of that temple. And it had to be exactly the way that plan was laid out, that pattern that was given to Moses by God. So we're going to look at just a small, I mean, you can read it for a couple of, of, of chapters if you want to at some point or another, but we're just going to look at a little small section of the construction of the walls of the tabernacle. So in Exodus 25, uh, 26, 15, Exodus 26, 15, it says this, And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of sheet of wood standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of the board. Two tenons shall there be on one board, set in order one against another. Thus shalt thou make all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle 
20 boards on the south side southward, and thou shalt make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenants, and two sockets under the other board for his two tenants. I want you to go ahead and turn on, I'm going to talk about that for a second, but I want you to go on and turn over to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, Ephesians 2, 19, Ephesians 2, 19. To say the tabernacle was well made would be an understatement, an underestimation, of course, and uh, because they used the best materials, God had them bring in the very best materials, he chose the very best workmen, and they were all chosen by God, everything was chosen by God. The tabernacle was portable, but I wouldn't say that it was temporary, as we say temporary, as we think of a te temporary, or look at temporary, because it was used for the 40 years through the wilderness, then it was used for the, for the rule of Joshua, which was 25 more years. Then for the period of the judges, which was about 350 years. Then the reign of Saul, 40 years. And then through the reign of David, which was 33 years. So it was, it was, it was, the tabernacle was used for almost 500 years. That was a portable, temporary one that lasted for 500 years. It probably lasted more than any of the other temples did, probably. The actual permanent temples did. But until Solomon became king and built the first temple, it was used. Now I want you to look at, uh, at Exodus 26, 15 because I believe it, it goes along with what we're going to look at here in a moment. And I want you to see how that wood was held together, how it was tightly fit together, how it was fitted just perfectly, how everything was made. Things were made from silver and gold and there were sockets and tenons which would be joints and, and, uh, and uh, places to put the board and stuff in. And, uh, and that describes the relationship of the body of Christ, which is the church, which is the church, the body of believers. And it describes our relationship to Christ. In Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 19, it says this. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together growing, groweth into an, a holy temple, in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So there was much care taken to make that, that tabernacle and everything just fit and work right together, and that's the way that the body of Christ is supposed to be is supposed to be made. I want you to go and turn over to Revelation chapter 15, verse 5. Revelation 15, 5. The tabernacle and the temple themselves were both set up in, in the, exactly the same way. They weren't the same size, but they were set up the same way. They had the same furnishings, the same furniture inside. Everything that went inside was exactly the same of it. They both had an outer court, a big area on the out, uh, outside or, or outside the holy place, which was a tent set up inside, and the holy of holy place, which was a tent behind that. Well, actually, they were the same tent, but we were divided by a great big... Uh, curtain. So there was the, out, the outer court, the holy, the holy place, and then the holy of holies place, or the holiest place. Now I think we can look at that and we can see by those three things there and, and, and the importance of them that they uh, represent the Trinity of God, which would be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, uh, the outer court would, would probably be, well, so, and I'll talk about man also, but the outer court would probably be uh, uh, the body of Jesus Christ, the outward appearance of him. Then the holy place probably be the Holy Spirit, and the holy of holies would probably be uh, for the soul of the Trinity, which is God the Father. Now it would also uh, represent man, as we can see, if we have the man as a three parts as well, because we're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God and we're three in one. We are the body, the soul, and the spirit. And now so that represents man as well. Uh, now, the thing of it is, that's very holy there. And, and man is not holy. We don't, and I sp uh, spoke about this a little bit this morning. The only way we have any holiness or any righteousness at all is because of Jesus Christ's righteousness. And, uh, and that is the only way that we have. Now that outer court out there had an altar where they would uh, sacrifice to God, or they would sacrifice the Lamb. And that obviously, is that we, as any of us know, any Christian knows, that represents that Jesus Christ was sacrificed for our sins, just as the, uh, as the Israelites uh, sacrificed that Lamb for their sins. Uh, the tabernacle is called by many names. It's called the tabernacle of the covenant. It's called the tabernacle of the congregation. And it's called the tabernacle of the testimony. Now within that tabernacle of the testimony, 
uh, is uh, the testimony of uh, what's called the testimony of witness, and a testimony is a testimony of witness. Within that, it's, uh, it had uh, the Holy of Holies, and within the Holy of Holies was the testimony, or the Ark of the Testimony. And within the Ark of the Testimony was the tables of testimony. So, you know, that's important. It's important. It was a, it was a witness. The whole thing was a witness. They were all tokens. It was all tokens of the covenant that God had made with Israel and that he makes with, uh, with Christians as well now. To be their God and to be our protector and our God. Uh, you know, that God's part of that was that he would keep them safe and he would be their God, but their part was that they would follow the laws and follow the commandments. And of course, they couldn't always do that. We can't always follow. That's why we needed Christ. That's why we needed a Savior, because none of us could do that. Uh, Revelation 15 brings, though, what we were talking about there, brings that all together. It brings that temple. It brings the tabernacle. It brings the, the uh, testimony. It brings it all together up in heaven and in the last day. We're going to look at this here in uh, Revelation chapter 15, verse 5, and it says, And after, and this is John, of course, the revelator speaking, said, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with gold girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels golden vials full of the wrath of God, who live forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. I want you to go ahead and turn over to Second King, I mean First Kings 6.13. First Kings 6.13. First Kings 6.13. You know, David didn't always do right. He didn't always do the right things. He, made, he did some pretty horrific things at some time. But, you know, David loved God. He loved God, and he sought to please God when his flesh wouldn't get in the way. Uh, he, sought, he sought to please him when he could. One day, as David sat in his house, and his house was probably a great fine uh, palace. I mean, he was the king. He was the king. The king got whatever he wanted usually, and they usually uh, had great big uh, castles and, and uh palaces and stuff like that, and God had given him rest from his enemies at this, at this particular time. And David was sitting in there in his palace, and he was looking around at all the great things and all the wonderful things that God had done for him, and, it occur and something occurred to him, to him. David realized this. 2 Samuel 7, 2 says uh, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. Now David come, I mean, uh, Nathan kind of made a little mistake here. I mean, it, it was, uh, it wasn't nothing bad intention to it, but Nathan said, you know, do all that your heart desires, you know, do whatever's in your heart because God is with you. And, uh, and so he told David, go ahead and build that temple because God's with you. But when David left there, God came to him that night and said, no, David can't build that temple. David's a man of war. He can't build that temple. He can't do that. He said, but I'll tell you one thing. He said, uh, and this is paraphrased, of course, God doesn't speak like this, but uh, he said, uh, uh, you know, nobody through the history, through judges, through any of the other kings, through any of the other people I've ever talked about building me a permanent dwelling place, a permanent house. He said, since you have done that, since you have done that, I'm going to allow your son. He said, you can't do it because you're a man of war. But I'm going to allow your son to build that house, to build me a house, a dwelling place for the ark, for, a belt, for the glory of God. And he said, and I'm going to have one of your uh, uh, seed on the throne forever. And, of course, we know that to be Jesus Christ, uh, who is the supreme ruler. We do know that. Now, David wasn't able to build the house of the Lord, but he did start getting uh, the materials and the supplies to build it to do that. And then when Solomon, his son, became king, uh, the rest of the supplies were gotten in and what he was needed. He even got the Hiram, the king of uh, Tyre, who did love David, uh, to give him enough cedar to build that temple with. In uh, 1 Kings 6.1, uh, 1 Kings 6, 1, and we're going to turn to what I told you to admit, it uh, tells us this. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth, uh, fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now I want you to be in 1 Kings 6, 37. It says this, uh, in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of 
of the Lord laid in the month Ziph. And in the eleventh year, in the month Bull, uh, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it, so was it, so was he seven years in building it, in building it. Now I want you to turn back over to the New Testament again. I want you to go over to John, uh, John chapter 2, verse 19, John 2, 19. The tabernacle and the temple, they're almost the same thing. They're really, really close to the same thing. And, and why well, I just had you read this part right here, they have the, they have the, matter of fact, sometimes the, the, the tabernacle was called the temple before the temple was built, before Solomon's temple was built. The difference between the two is what we just read there. The first thing that Solomon did was lay this foundation. You know, the foundation. Now, the uh, one in the tabernacle uh, in, the, in the wilderness did not have a foundation to it. They would just put those sockets were put down, the boards were stood up on it. So it didn't have a, a, a firm foundation in it. Now, that is uh, the reason I think that the tabernacle in the, in the wilderness and the tabernacle that they had before the, the temple was built, it represents man. It represents man because of the, of the lack of a foundation there. Because we don't, because we don't, you know, the, the human body is tempor temporary. We're all aware of that. It's temporary, just as that uh, one in the wilderness was, was said to be temporary. Uh, and uh, uh, before that permanent one was built, it didn't have a, 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 a foundation. And without Jesus Christ, we have no foundation. Until we have Jesus Christ, that's the only time we have Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ himself. He, he uh, uh, likened his own body to that temple that was in Jerusalem. And I told you to go to John uh, chapter 2, verse 19. And it says, uh, And Je Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? Now this was uh, the, the, the third temple. This was a Solomon's temple. And it says, but he spake of the temple of his body. So Jesus Christ was talking about the temple of his body. He called his body the temple. And that was uh, the temple in Jerusalem, of course, the one that had the foundation. Now uh, we want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians 6.19. 1 Corinthians 6.19. The Bible calls our bodies a tabernacle or temporary dwelling place. Uh, while we're on this earth, 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that if our earthly house or this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, I want to give you a little something to think about here. Is that what, uh, what the Apostle Paul is talking about there? Was that what Jesus Christ was talking about in, in John when he tells us that he went to prepare a place for us? If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Is that body that we have, is that what he went to prepare for us? I mean, we all think about, you know, he said, my father's house is many mansions. So we always think, well, we got a mansion to live in in heaven, which we may have. I don't know that. We may have, we may not have. And as Brother Pat used to say, it says he has, my father's house, ha house has many mansions, but he don't say that he's going to give us a mansion. We're going to be satisfied with whatever he gives us. Well, that yeah. body, that body is, is going to be uh, uh, maybe what he, what he went to prepare for us. It might be what he went to prepare for us, and we'll be satisfied with that. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he warns us here in 1 Corinthians not to commit sins against our own body because it's a temple, not to make, make sense. He's saying he's talking mainly about fornication. He's told not, you know, flee fornication, he told his Corinthians. And he's telling us as well that flee fornication because it's a sin against your own body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glory, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So it says, what you know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Go ahead and turn it over to uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Dexter, you can deal with them on up. The body is a temporary dwelling place, and we know that. A place to while we're here on this earth, a place for us to stay and, and uh, live in while we're here on this earth. Uh, but if we're born again by belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are to treat our bodies as a temple. 
We're to treat them as a temper of the Holy Spirit. We should use the same, the same time. We should use this time that we're given. We should try to use it wisely to glorify God and to, and to spread his gospel. Peter said this in 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14. Yea, I think it not me, I think it me, rather, as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. This tabernacle that we are in is temporary. The Bible made it very plain. We're going to, it's going to be gone, lost to us at some point. We will be, you know, we will die. We'll, we'll, we'll go wherever we're going to go, depending on what we do here on this earth. The tabernacle, the temple, the house of God, they're all point to the church, which is the body of Jesus Christ. The believers, the brothers and sisters in Christ. And then, of course, our access to God. Now, if you've not made your election and, and you're calling, sure, the Bible tells you that by belief, then you are in fellowship with the devil. You're in fellowship with the Satan and you're heading for a devil's hell. The Bible makes that very plain, folks. And it makes it plain that it's not a very good place. That it's a place of darkness. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of torments where those that are gnashing of teeth for pain. And that's a pain that's not ever going to go away. That's a pain that no painkiller or no pain reliever could ever help. The temple connected the people of Israel to God. That was their connection with God. But then they had to go through a priest also. And they had to have that priest present their uh, petitions before God. Or their sacrifice before God. And that veil in the temple, as I talked about earlier, that separated man and God. But when Jesus Christ died, the Bible says that that was torn from the top down to the bottom. That's not with a little thin curtain like you got hanging in your living room. That's like a leaven uh, thing thick of a animal scans and stuff. That was a big, thick curtain. That wasn't no easy task. But by doing that, by, by tearing that in two, he opened up the throne of God. Uh, he opened it up uh, for those that worship him, for those that pray through Jesus Christ. When we pray, and we've talked about this before, but when you pray, you know, you, you use the Holy Trinity. You pray in the Spirit. You pray through Jesus Christ, and you pray to the Father. Uh, but 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 if you haven't if you haven't ever made your uh, calling election sure, then you've never done what it says to do here in Romans chapter ten verse nine, where it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse thirteen says this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That don't sound too difficult to me. You know what? You know what is hard, I guess, sometimes? To believe. If you don't believe, then it's hard to believe. And if you can't if you can't believe that, then I'm afraid you can't be saved. But if you believe that Jesus Christ was Lord. He is Lord, and that's with a capital L, the Lord of all things. The Lord of lords and the King of kings. The, Bible, the Old Testament even says he's the God of gods. If you've got to believe that he is the Lord, and you've got to confess that, you've got to say to him at least, you've got to say to him, you are the Lord of all things. You're Lord of my life. You're Lord of everything. You created everything. You're the master of all things. You've got to say that. Then it says, thou shalt be saved. Then how do you get saved? You call on his name, and thou shalt be saved then. Then he'll save you. God will save you. God says he'll do something. The Bible says that you can count it as if it's already happened. Amen. When you say that you're saved, when you, when you, when you get saved, when you... Say that you believe Jesus Christ, and you do believe in your heart because you can just say stuff without believing it. You know, you can tell lies and, and say that you believe it, and you don't believe it. But when you believe it in your heart, and you tell God that you do, and you ask Him to save you, then the Bible says your, your name is written in that heaven. Yours is the same as being in heaven. It's written in that Lamb's book of life, and it's the same as you being there already. We have a home waiting for us in heaven. But hey, if God has spoken to you here, and if you're not quite sure exactly what I'm talking about, I'll be glad to take the Bible and show you more perfectly how it can be. Now, nothing I say is going to be perfect, but if I can read out of the Word of God, that's going to be perfect. Word of God is truth. Absolutely. I'm human, and, I, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm prone to sin. I'm prone to, uh, to, to have, get things wrong. But I believe that this Bible here, I believe this King James Version of the Bible is infallible. I believe it's the perfect word of God, and I believe that it is, as it says of itself, absolute truth. It is. The only absolute truth. 
And what is the truth? It's the good news. It's the good tidings. It's the gospel. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we sing. Just as I am.